King Kinneris, like King David, is portrayed always with a lyre or harp in his hand. In fact, Kenor, the Hebrew word used for harp that David plays in 1 Samuel 16.23, which says, And whenever the Spirit from God came upon Saul, David would pick up his Kenor harp and play, and Saul would become well, and the spirit of distress would depart from him. Both King David and King Kinneris have etymological and artistic connections through this depiction of kings playing the Kenor. While David is the father of King Solomon, who introduces the worship of Aphrodite into the house of God, King Kinneris is the father of Adonis, who also introduces the worship of Aphrodite into the kingdom of Cyprus. And Solomon, like Adonis, is loved by hundreds of women. Solomon has hundreds of concubines, and Adonis has hundreds of lovers. Also, Adonis, like Jesus Christ, is mourned for by women, like Mary. And like Jesus, the blood of Adonis is thought to hold the power of eternal life. Every year during the spring equinox, the annual death and resurrection of Adonis was celebrated by the Cyprians and Phoenicians, similar to the Easter celebration of Christianity. Welcome back, Gnosis Seekers. Today, we are about to uncover the fascinating layers of history, culture, and mythology from across the world. We are diving into the sparkling Mediterranean, to an island that's seen the rise and fall of empires, the blend of civilizations, and the birthplace of gods and goddesses. Cyprus, the home of Aphrodite, also known as Venus. In this video, we will navigate through time, unearthing the origins of the religions that have thrived on this sun-soaked island and the journey into an age where gods and goddesses held sway over the hearts and minds of the people. Yes, we're talking about two figures who have not only shaped Cypriot culture, but have left a lasting impact on Western civilization at large, the alluring Aphrodite and the handsome Adonis. From Neolithic hunter-gatherers to the Bronze Age worship of the Lady of Cyprus and from the cults of Aphrodite and Adonis in the classical era to the lingering legends in the present day folklore, this video will guide you through a journey of faith, myth, and the intertwining of both in a tale as old as time. Buckle up, Sophia lovers. We're about to embark on an epic exploration of love, beauty, tragedy, and rebirth on the island of love itself. If you're as excited as we are to plunge into these ancient narratives, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel for more exciting historical adventures. Now, let's set sail and dive deep into the captivating religions of Cyprus and the enthralling stories of Aphrodite and Adonis. Cyprus has a long history with evidence of human habitation dating back as far as the 10th millennium, 10,000 BCE. These earliest inhabitants are believed to have been hunter-gatherers who cross over to the island from the nearby regions of modern-day Lebanon. The first major wave of civilization in Cyprus was during the Neolithic period around 7,000 to 6,000 BCE, when farming communities began to develop. The Bronze Age, which started around 2,500 BCE, brought significant advancements to metallurgy and commerce. Cyprus has since been occupied by a series of different civilizations, including the Mycenaean Greeks, Phoenicians, Romans, Byzantines, Arab Caliphate, French, Venetians, Ottoman Turks, and British. The Neolithic period on Cyprus, also known as the New Stone Age, is characterized by significant advancements 
human technology and culture. It's believed to have started around 8000 BCE and lasted to around 3900 BCE, the a ceramic and ceramic Neolithic periods, with and without pottery. In the Aceramic Neolithic period, Cyprus saw its first permanent human settlements, dating around 8000 BCE. These inhabitants lived in round houses and survived mainly by hunting, gathering, and fishing. The Kirokitia culture is a well-known example of this period with well-preserved archaeological sites that has provided a great deal of information about the early settlers' way of life. These Kirokatiya people are known for their innovative architecture, including stone round houses, which were often partially buried in the ground for insulation. The ceramic Neolithic period from 4500 to 3900 BC marked the introduction of more sophisticated tools and the beginning of agriculture and trade. The Sotira culture is a significant group from this period. During this time, Cyprus had significant interactions with surrounding regions, especially the Levantine coast, and evidenced by commonality in certain types of pottery and other artifacts. Despite being an island, Cyprus had a rich Neolithic culture that closely mirrored the major developments happening on the mainland at the same time. The evidence of these ancient cultures provides invaluable insights into human journey from hunter-gatherers to settled farming communities. The Copper Age, also known as the Chacolithic Age, in Cyprus is believed to have begun around 3900 BCE and continued until the advent of the Bronze Age around 2500 BCE. This period is characterized by a development of copper use in addition to stone for tools and other items. While farming continued to be the primary source of sustenance during the Copper Age, the inhabitants of Cyprus began to master the smelting and working of copper, which was abundant on the island. This allowed for the production of more durable tools, weapons, and other objects, facilitating a significant advancement in technology. Idols for worship were designed during this period. The Cypriot Chocolithic period is also noted for the production of distinctively decorated pottery for the beginning of trade relations with the surrounding regions. Artifacts from this period such as the cruciform figurines, plank-shaped figurines, and pottery with complex incised decoration show a sophistication in their craftsmanship. These artifacts indicate that society was becoming more complex with the development of new rituals and social norms. In terms of settlement, people during this period tended to live in small villages, usually built on hills, which allowed them to easily defend themselves. Burial practices also became more elaborate during this Copper Age, with the dead often buried under the floors of homes or in designated cemeteries. Grave goods became more common, suggesting a belief in the afterlife. This was an important period in Cyprus's history as the technological advancements and cultural developments set the stage for the Bronze Age, during which the island became a significant player in the Eastern Mediterranean region. The Bronze Age of Cyprus, also known as the Cypriot Bronze Age, extended from 2300 to 1000. BCE. This period saw the development of more complex political economic systems and the emergence of new religious practices. Based on the archaeological evidence, it appears that a fertility goddess was widely worshipped on Cyprus during the Bronze Age. This is suggested by numerous terracotta figurines of women, often pregnant or with emphasized sexual characteristics which have been found in tombs and sanctuaries. The bowl also appears to have been an important religious symbol, possibly associated with fertility, strength, and power. Horn bowl figurines and images of bowls are common in Bronze Age Cypriot art. Numerous Bronze Age sanctuaries have been discovered on Cyprus, 
These often include open-air altars and a variety of religious artifacts, including figurines and ceremonial vessels. Some sanctuaries also contain large stone structures, possibly used for communal religious ceremonies. During the Bronze Age, the dead were often buried with a variety of grave goods, suggesting a belief in an afterlife. These grave goods often included religious objects and figurines. Cyprus became increasingly integrated into the wider Mediterranean world during this late Bronze Age. This was a period of extensive trade and international diplomacy. Cypriot pottery and other goods were widely distributed across the region. Cyprus was a major supplier of copper to the Mycenaean Greeks and was part of a cultural exchange network that included the Hittites, Egyptians, and Babylonians. These interactions likely influenced religious practices and beliefs, and during this time, the Greek goddess Aphrodite became prominent in Cypriot religion. Through the Iron Age and into the year 570 BCE, Cyprus was conquered by Egypt under Pharaoh Amasis II. This brief period of Egyptian domination left its influence mainly in the arts, especially sculptures, where the rigid and the dress of the Egyptian style can be observed. Cypriot artists later discarded this Egyptian style in favor of Greek prototypes. Statues in stone often show a mixture of Egyptian and Greek influence. In particular, ceramics recovered on Cyprus show influence from the ancient Minoans of Crete. Men often wore Egyptian wigs and Assyrian-style beards. Armor and dress showed Western Asiatic elements as well. During the Classical period, Cyprus came under the influence of the Persian Empire and later the Greeks and Romans. Cypriot kings adopted Persian customs and religions while maintaining their Greek identity, and the island became a place where Western and Eastern cultures mixed. Cyprus was known as the birthplace of Aphrodite, and the sanctuary of Aphrodite at Paphos became an important pilgrimage site, influencing religious practices across the entire world. Cyprus was part of the Byzantine Empire for many centuries and played a crucial role in the spread of Christianity in the Eastern Mediterranean. The island was a center of monasticism and produced significant religious figures and texts. Later, under the Venetian rule, Cyprus was a key player in the Crusades and a link between the Western Europe and Holy Land. Cyprus remained a place where different cultures and religions coexisted under Ottoman and British rule. Today, Cyprus is still divided between the Greek Cypriot South and Turkish Cypriot North, reflecting the island's complex history and its continued role as a meeting place of different cultures. They are now divided by the Greek Orthodox Christians and Sunni Islam. But long before these religions took root, Cyprus had its own religion, which influenced the broader Mediterranean world. Even Christianity and Islam borrow elements from the native religions of Cyprus. King David, Mary, and Jesus may have been influenced by the stories of King Kinneris, Mira, and Adonis. But before we explore these, first we need to examine what led up to the foundational myths of Cyprus. And this takes us back once again to the Bronze Age. In the Bronze Age, we begin to see an emergence of goddess figurines, often referred to as the Great Goddess or Mother Goddess, associated with fertility, agriculture, and nature. She is often depicted as a robust woman, sometimes pregnant with their hands on her hips. These terracotta figurines, known as plank figures, have been found in various sites across Cyprus. In the late Bronze Age, we start to see a goddess who would become a central figure in Cypriot religion. 
the Lady of Cyprus. She would later become identified with Aphrodite by the Greeks, but also as Estarte by the Phoenicians due to her association with fertility, nature, and love. Similarly, male deities associated with war, death, and the underworld, the precursors to figures like Adonis, also appear to have been worshipped. Archaeological evidence from this time suggests that bulls, doves, and snakes were considered sacred and featured in religious practices, likely as symbols or avatars of particular deities. Bulls, for instance, are often associated with the virility and power while snakes can symbolize rebirth and renewal due to their shedding skin. By the time of the Iron Age and the arrival of Greek colonists, these indigenous gods had largely been syncretized with the Greek pantheon. The Lady of Cyprus was fully identified with Aphrodite, while other local deities were recognized as Zeus, Hera, Dionysus, and so on. The Greek influence would shape the religious landscape of Cyprus for many centuries to come. Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of fertility, was widely worshipped throughout ancient Greece and Cyprus. Cyprus is traditionally considered one of the main centers of her worship and is also claimed to be the place of her birth. Pinpointing the exact date for when the worship of Aphrodite first began on Cyprus is challenging. It's likely that the goddess was introduced to the island by the Mycenaeans during the 12th and 11th centuries BCE. Aphrodite, as we know her from Greek mythology, is thought to have evolved from earlier goddesses of fertility, Eastern Mediterranean region. This earlier goddess is linked to the Phoenician goddess Astarte and the Mesopotamian goddess Ishtar. When the Greeks settled on Cyprus, they may have identified this indigenous goddess with Aphrodite and adopted some of the local religious practices. The earliest inscriptions explicitly mentioning Aphrodite on Cyprus date to the first millennium BCE, after the island had come under significant Greek influence. Although the mother of Cyprus, the predecessor to this goddess, began much earlier. Cyprus, often referred to as the island of Aphrodite due to its long association with this goddess. Aphrodite is said to have been born here from the sea foam near Cyprus after Kronos castrated his father Aranos and threw his genitals into the sea. Aphrodite was then born from the sea foam that arose from this event. Sanctuaries and temples dedicated to Aphrodite have been found across the island. These often featured statues and images of the goddess where devotees could leave offerings. Rituals associated with Aphrodite included the use of substances potions, and communal orgies and feasts, sacrifices and prayers, and hymns to the goddess. The getting up at dawn and singing hymns to Aphrodite was a commonplace throughout Cyprus. Fertility rites, given Aphrodite's role as the fertility goddess, sacred prostitution, and other revelry rites were likely a part of her worship. One of the most significant sites of Aphrodite on Cyprus is the Sanctuary of Aphrodite at Pele Paphos, Old Paphos. This was one of the most important religious centers in the entire ancient Greek world, and it remained an important pilgrimage site until it was shut down by Theodosius. It's notable that the cult image of Aphrodite at this site was not a human form, but an aniconic symbol, often described as a conical stone, suggesting a continuation of pre-Greek religious practices. Another significant site is Petra II Romeo, also known as Aphrodite's Rock, a sea stack located off the southern coast of Cyprus. This is traditionally considered to be her birthplace. The goddess's influence can be seen in numerous aspects of Cypriot history and culture, and she remains a symbol of the island to this day.
Adonis was a figure in Greek mythology known for his extraordinary beauty. He was believed to be the beloved by Aphrodite, which often associates him with sites and practices related to Aphrodite's worship. It is said that Adonis is the one to introduce the rites of Aphrodite to the kingdom of Cyprus. While Adonis himself was not a god, his story has religious undertones and he was the focus of festivals and rituals, especially those related to the fertility and regenerative powers of nature. And he later becomes a god after his death and resurrection by becoming deified through the power of Aphrodite. At Paphos, the religious custom of religious prostitution is said to have been instituted by King Kinneris and to have been practiced by his daughters, the sisters of Adonis, who, having incurred the wrath of Aphrodite, mated with strangers and ended their days in Egypt. King Kinneris is mentioned by Pindar as beloved of Apollo and the priest of Aphrodite. Pindar mentions Kinneris as being fabulously rich in the Nemead Ode 8, line 18, which says, For prosperity that is planted with the God's blessing is more abiding for men. Such prosperity as once loaded Kinneris with wealth in sea-washed Cyprus, similar to the rich kingdom that David and Solomon have. Later in Greek and Roman literature, and in the Christian fathers such as Clement of Alexandria, the story of Kinneris is elaborated. They say that on Cyprus, Kinneris was revered as the creator of art and musical instruments, such as the harp and the flute. King Kinneris, like King David, is portrayed always with a lyre or harp in his hand. In fact, Kinnor, the Hebrew word used for harp that David plays in 1 Samuel 16.23, which says, And whenever the Spirit from God came upon Saul, David would pick up his kinor, harp, and play, and Saul would become well, and the spirit of distress would depart from him. Both King David and King Kinneris have etymological and artistic connections through this depiction of kings playing the kinor. While David is the father of King Solomon, who introduces the worship of Aphrodite into the house of God, King Kinneris is the father of Adonis, who also introduces the worship of Aphrodite into the kingdom of Cyprus. Both Adonis and Solomon are born through adulterous lust. David, who sinfully ravages Uriah the Hittite, and Kinneris, whose daughter Mira sinfully tricks Kinneris into ancestral relations. Both kings repent for their sins, and Solomon, like Adonis, is loved by hundreds of women. Solomon has hundreds of concubines, and Adonis has hundreds of lovers. Also, Adonis, like Jesus Christ, is mourned for by women, like Mary. And like Jesus, the blood of Adonis is thought to hold the power of eternal life. Every year, during the spring equinox, the annual death and resurrection of Adonis was celebrated by the Cyprians and Phoenicians, similar to the Easter celebration of Christianity. The earliest known Greek reference to Adonis comes from a fragment of a poem by the poet Sappho of Lesbos in which a chorus of young girls ask Aphrodite what they can do to mourn Adonis' death. Aphrodite replies that they must beat their breasts and tear their tunics. The cult of Adonis, also described as corresponding to the cult of the Phoenician god Baal, as Walter Burkett explains, women sit by the gate, weeping for Tammuz, or they offer incense to Baal, on rooftops and plant pleasant plants. These are the very features of the Adonis legend, which is celebrated on the flat rooftops on which sherds sown with quickly germinating green saladed are placed as the gardens of Adonis. The climax is loud lamentation for the dead god. Ezekiel 
shows knowledge of this right in Book 814. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Among the stories which were told of King Kinneris, the ancestor of the priestly kings of Paphos, and the father of Adonis, there are some that deserve our attention. In the first place, he is said to have begotten his son Adonis in this incestuous intercourse with Mira, his daughter, at a festival of the corn goddess Demeter, at which women robed in white were to offer corn wreaths as first fruits of the harvest and to observe strict chastity for nine days. Similar cases of incest with a daughter are reported by many ancient kings. One that comes to mind, the story of Judah and Tamar in Genesis, is almost verbatim to the story of how Mira dresses up as a prostitute to trick Kinneris. Tamar also dresses up as a prostitute and tricks Judah into having intercourse with her. Mira, who does the same with Kinneris, gives birth to Adonis, and it's from this line of Judah where Jesus is born. Adonis was also said to have been loved by other gods, such as Apollo, Heracles, and Dionysus. He was described as androgynous, for he acted like a man in his affections for Aphrodite, but as a woman for Apollo. Androgynous here means that Adonis took on passive feminine role with his love for Apollo. Heracles' love of Adonis is mentioned in passing by Ptolemy Hephaestion. The text states that due to his love for Adonis, Aphrodite taught Nessos, the Kentar, how to trap and ensnare him. Another tradition stated that Dionysus, the Greek god of wine and madness, carried Adonis off after seeing his beauty. In Cyprus, as in many parts of the ancient Greek world, there were annual festivals known as the Adonia. These festivals were primarily led by women and took place during the hottest part of the summer. They revolved around the myth of Adonis, death and resurrection, symbolizing the seasonal cycle of vegetation, the death of plants in the heat of summer and their rebirth in the cooler months. During the Adonia, women would plant gardens of Adonis, usually small pots or baskets filled with fast-growing plants. These plants would sprout quickly, but then wilt and die, representing Adonis's premature death. Women would mourn and wail for Adonis in ritual lamentations, carrying the wilted plants and images of Adonis in funeral-like processions. According to Lucian D. Dea Seria, each year during the festival of Adonis, the Adonis River in Lebanon, now known as the Abraham River, ran red with blood. Despite these mournful rituals, the festivals of Adonis also had elements of celebration. They were often marked by feasting, singing hymns, dancing, revelry, drinking wine, and kaikion a psychedelic substance, as well as orgies, involving erotic elements, giving Adonis's role as a symbol of physical beauty and desire. Adonis and Aphrodite are closely linked and their stories are often intertwined, which would have naturally led to some synchronicity in their worship. According to the myth, Aphrodite was smitten by the extraordinary beauty of Adonis, a mortal, and took him as her lover. However, Adonis was tragically killed in his prime after going hunting for a boar and was killed by a boar, causing Aphrodite's immense grief. The death and resurrection of Adonis, symbolizing the annual cycle of vegetation, were central themes in his worship. Aphrodite, as the goddess of fertility and the generative powers of nature brings Adonis to life as a new god, where he 
to take on half the year in the underworld for Persephone to rise for half the year. Persephone would then return to the underworld for half the year. This thematic overlap could have encouraged the synchronization of all these religious cults, including the Eleusinian Mysteries. The festivals of Adonis or Adonia were characterized by the mourning for the dead and celebrating resurrection. The Greeks were adept at syncretism. When they encountered new deities in the places they colonized or traded with, they often identified these new gods with their own. This led to a blending of myths, rituals, and iconography. Aphrodite herself was commonly linked with Ishtar and Adonis commonly linked with Demutsi or Tammuz. There's also the Phoenician myth of Eshmun and Astarte, in which Eshmun bleeds out and dies, and is raised up and turned into a god by Astarte, just like Adonis. The blending of these worships would have been part of a broader process of cultural exchange and syncretism. Adonis is a significant figure in Greek mythology. He represents the natural cycle of life and death in an agricultural context as his story embodies the death of vegetation and the rebirth of springtime. In the myth, Adonis is an incredibly beautiful mortal who is loved by not only Aphrodite, but also Persephone, the goddess of the underworld. This is why he is to spend half the year in the underworld. Aphrodite, reflecting the seasonal cycle. However, Adonis is not destined to remain in the underworld forever. In some versions, Zeus intervenes to mediate between Aphrodite and Persephone, decreeing that Adonis would spend half the year, thus marking his annual resurrection. The agricultural societies of ancient Greece, this myth would have been the most powerful resonance. The departure of Adonis to the underworld can be seen to correspond with the period when seeds are sown and fields lay fallow while his return marks the time of growth and harvest. The mourning of Aphrodite corresponds to the barren period, while her joy at his return is a time of abundance, which also links fertility to the matter. Due to the abundance of wealth in agriculture, fertility is the next thing that follows in any society. Aphrodite's mourning and subsequent joy echo the human experience as these cycles are seen in everyday aspects of life. The myth of Venus, the Roman counterpart to the Greek goddess Aphrodite and Adonis, is one of the most famous tales in classical mythology, told by the poet Ovid, showcasing love, beauty, and tragedy. Here's the basic story. Adonis, the son of Mira and her father Cinyris, was an incredibly handsome young man. Venus, the goddess of love and beauty, was so smitten by his beauty that she decided to hide him in a chest and entrusted the chest to Persephone, the queen of the underworld, for safekeeping. Persephone was also taken by Adonis's beauty when she opened the chest and refused to give him back to Venus. The dispute between the two goddesses was eventually settled by Zeus the decision was that Adonis would spend one-third of the year with Venus, one-third of the year with Persephone, and one-third of the year with whoever he chooses. Adonis, in love with Venus, chose to spend his final third of the year with her. Despite Venus's warning to avoid dangerous wild beasts, Adonis was killed by a wild boar during a hunting expedition. Some versions of the story say that the boar was Ares, the god of war, and jealous lover of Venus in disguise. Other versions suggest that the boar was sent by Apollo or Artemis as punishment for Venus's affairs. Devastated by Adonis's death, Venus mourned him deeply. Wherever Adonis's blood fell, roses grew, representing his loss. Some versions of the myth also state that Venus pricked her foot on a thorn of the rose while rushing to Adonis's side. Venus appeals to Zeus, and he allows Adonis to return from the dead for a part of the year, symbolizing seasonal cycle of vegetation and death and resurrection.
According to Diodorus' Bibliotheca, King Kinneris was a descendant of Eos and Cephalus, which would make Adonis a direct descendant of the line of Lucifer, or Eosphoros. Kinneris' father, Sandicus, was an immigrant from Syria who settled in Silica and founded a city, Selenderus. Kinneris, upon his arrival in Cyprus, with some of his people, founded the town of Paphos and married Metharme, daughter of King Pygmalion of Cyprus. Pausanias mentions a daughter of Kinneris as the consort of Teucer, who was the son of King Telamon of Salamis, and his second wife, Hesione, daughter of King Laomedine of Troy. He fought alongside his half-brother Ajax in the Trojan War and is the legendary founder of the city of Salamis on Cyprus. Through his mother, Teucer was the nephew of King Priam of Troy and the cousin of Hector and Paris, all of whom he fought against in the Trojan War. He is known to have received the kingdom of Cyprus from Belus of Tyre for having assisted him in the invasion of the island. Teucer married Euenae, who Pausanias says is the daughter of Cyprus. Venus's temples were erected in Rome during the 200s BCE to solicit her assistance in battles and individual leaders later allied themselves with the deity, claiming to be descent from her bloodline. Julius Caesar and his heir Augustus, along with everyone in the Julio-Claudian dynasty, forged particular explicit ties to Venus, claiming descent through her son, the Trojan hero Aeneas, when he founded the city of Rome after the Trojan War. The goddess was repeatedly represented in civic architecture and on coins, the star of Venus was present and her attractive figure became symbolic of Roman power throughout the empire. The statue, the Venus of Capua from the second century of the Common Era was discovered in the amphitheater in Southern Italy. It is the largest example of a sculptural type that derives from a now lost cult statue of Aphrodite in Corinth and in Athens. When Julius Caesar was killed, it is said that Venus was there at his funeral, and the people said, according to Suetonius, that they saw Venus take Julius Caesar's ghost and bring it up into the heavens. The poet Ovid writes about this at the end of Metamorphosis. It says, while Asclepius came to Rome from abroad, Julius Caesar was born in Rome. Caesar was a genius in matters of war and peace and did many heroic things, but his greatest achievement was fathering his son, Caesar Augustus. Before Augustus was born, Julius Caesar became a god. This is how it happened. Venus foresees that Julius Caesar is about to be murdered by traitors from his government and flies into a rage. She feels she has suffered an unfair amount of treachery. She had to fight against Juno's rage to protect Aeneas, and now Aeneas's only living descendant, Julius Caesar, is under threat. The gods are moved by Venus's despair, although they can't alter fate. They try to warn Rome of the imminent tragedy by filling the streets with omens, Blood rains from the clouds, owls hoot, dogs howl, priests botch sacrifices, and the streets are haunted with ghosts. Despite these warnings, the two traitors enter the Senate Hall, holding swords. At this moment, Venus attempts to hide Julius Caesar in clouds. Jupiter asks Venus why she is fighting fate. He has read the tablets written with the destiny of the world and knows that Julius Caesar has come to the end of his time. Venus will make him a god, and Caesar Augustus will avenge his death. In the ensuing battles between the Roman and barbarian lands, Augustus will be the hero. When he has brought peace to the world, Augustus will return to Rome and rule it justly. When he dies, he too will be made a god. Jupiter tells Venus to rescue Julius Caesar's soul from his dead body and make him into a comet. Venus goes to the Senate Hall in Rome and retrieves Caesar's soul 
As she carries it up to heaven, she feels it blaze. It escapes from her arms and flies higher than the moon when it becomes a star. The people in Rome say that Caesar Augustus is an even greater emperor than his father, although Augustus won't admit it. Throughout history, fathers yield their glory to their sons. Ovid calls on all the gods who fathered great men, praying that it will be a long time before the great Augustus leaves the world. He prays that when Augustus does become a god, he will continue to listen to the prayers of the people. This here shows how important and central Venus is to the people of Rome. These myths were especially popular in classical and Renaissance art, and themes from the story have become common motifs in Western culture. The name Adonis is often used today to refer to an exceptionally handsome young man. The representation of Venus or Aphrodite in art has undergone significant transformations from the classical Greek period to the Renaissance. Aphrodite was typically depicted as a beautiful and modestly standing or seated woman, often partially robed or nude. The most famous statue from the classical era is the Aphrodite at Nidos by Praxiteles, which was revolutionary for being one of the first full-scale depictions of the nude female form in Greek history. Praxiteles' statue became immensely popular and influenced numerous later representations of Aphrodite seen as a divinely inspired statue. During the Hellenistic period, depictions of Aphrodite became more diverse and the goddess was often shown in more informal and sensual poses. The Venus de Melo, now in Louvre, France, is an example from this period. It depicts Aphrodite in the middle of undressing, a theme known as Venus Pudica, modest Venus. During the Roman period from 1st century BCE to the 5th century of the Common Era, the Romans adopted Aphrodite as Venus. Venus was a popular subject in Roman art and was often depicted in a variety of contexts, including domestic settings and public sculpture. The Capitoline Venus, a type of Venus Pudica, is a notable example from this period. During the Roman Republic days, Venus Aracena was imported from Cyprus and was said to give Rome power over their enemies. During the Middle Ages, pagan subjects, including Venus, were less common in art due to the dominance of Christianity and Islam. However, Aphrodite did not completely disappear. She was sometimes included in illuminated manuscripts or moralized as a symbol of earthly love or carnal desire. By the Renaissance in the 14th to 17th centuries, a revival of interest in classical mythology and art had become present. Venus was again a popular subject, often depicted as a nude or semi-nude figure in a variety of contexts. Artists like Botticelli in his Birth of Venus and Titian in Venus of Urbino and Venus and Adonis created some of the most iconic images of Venus during this period. Renaissance depictions of Venus often emphasized her roles as a goddess of love and beauty, but they also sometimes included moral or allegorical dimensions. This progression reflects larger changes in cultural and artistic norms over these periods. The classical Greek emphasis on idealized beauty and physical perfection evolved into the Hellenistic focus on individualism and naturalism, while the Renaissance reimagined classical subjects in the light of its own intellectual and artistic interests. Throughout all these changes, Venus Aphrodite remained a powerful symbol of love, beauty, and desire. Wow, what an incredible journey we've been on today. 
delving into the mesmerizing world of ancient Cyprus and unraveling the mythical threads of Aphrodite and Adonis. From the oldest settlements of this enchanting island, sweeping waves of religious evolution, it's clear that Cyprus has been and remains a significant crossroads of civilization and faiths. The enduring tales of Aphrodite and Adonis are so much more than stories of divine romance and heartache. They are a testament to humanity's age-old quest to understand the world around us, giving form to the forces of nature, life, and death. Through the gods, we worship the rituals we perform and the myths we weave. We gain insights into our ancestors' perceptions of the world and their place within it. That is it for our journey through the religions of ancient Cyprus and the captivating tales of Aphrodite and Adonis. We hope you enjoyed this exploration as much as we did, and maybe even found a new perspective on how ancient faiths have shaped the cultures and societies we know today. If you found this journey fascinating, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe, and share this video with other history and mythology enthusiasts in your life. Your engagement helps us bringing history to life, and we appreciate your support. Also, leave a comment on what you think about this video or what other places of the world you want me to cover. Remember, history is not just a collection of past events, but a living, breathing entity, always waiting to be explored. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you won't miss out on our next voyage into the annals of time. Until then, keep seeking Gnosis, keep questioning, keep marveling at the mysteries of our shared human heritage. Thank you for watching, and you have just attained true Gnosis.